Okay, welcome to another uh, episode. This is the um, continuations part two of the tool episode. Uh, there were some things I left out of that, uh, so we're going to cover that now. So welcome to the Stardust and Golden channel. First of all, please hit subscribe. Um, and I ask if you there's anything in this video series you think I missed or you would like to see more of, uh, please comment and let me know. Uh, also, my email address is uh, posted, so if you want to just email something or, you know, you heard something that might have been misinformation or could be augmented, uh, please let me know. Okay, so welcome back. Last episode, there was a few things I forgot. I want to touch on those right now. And one of them was uh, we talked about all the hand tools. We talked about the electrical tools. And there was a lot of stuff that, um, especially with the hand tools, I wanted to cover. One of them was ratchets. Now, there's really no need. Um, I, on my personal boat, I never carry, you know, really expensive $300 ratchets from the Snap-on guy on my boat. I keep them at home. Um, sailing on a micro budget, like most of us do. Uh, I found a couple of manufacturers. One in particular, um, this ratchet here, uh, had a rubber handle on it. It's been exposed to chemicals and abuse for 43 years. And I'm still using it. I use this in more workplace. It was used almost daily. Um, so, and the reason that I'm going to offer up the company's name here is because I called them. I had broke the Paul in this just recently. The little ratcheting mechanism inside. And I actually called them and there was a human. I know, go figure. There was a customer service with an actual human voice. I didn't have to press 30 computer buttons and download a smartphone app to talk to somebody or send an email and wait three weeks. There was actually a human voice. The company was called Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T. Okay, now this is the original. It got caught in a motorcycle sprocket and half the rubber's missing off the handle. But this is 43 years old. They actually mailed me a new Paul for this. Uh, I had to pay for it. It wasn't really expensive. Uh, but one of the second things I like about this ratchet is on a boat, it's got one slip ring right here on the top. You can pull that slip ring right off of here and lubricate this. Now, in my tropical, I mean, uh, temperate zone, I use a 90-weight gear lube in here. In the tropics, that would work too. Uh, but when you get into Arctic regions, you really don't want to use that kind of oil. So just use a light type of motor oil in it or a really light, thin grease if you're going to end lightly. Um, mine, I keep... Uh, I probably oil it once a, once a year, if that. But it's nice to have oil in there because you don't want the springs deteriorating or the paws. They are made out of a steel that will rust. So you will never see rust on the outside of these ratchets, but the internal parts will. So keep them oiled and check it every year. That's one good thing about that company. It's called Wright. I highly recommend them. I usually don't plug people unless I got their permission, but I'm going to plug them because they actually had customer service. And today, in today's day and age, Anybody with customer service is getting a plug. That's just the way it is. <clears throat> okay. Um, the preference in the rest of this, I mean, one uh, extension is probably just as good as another, unless you're really putting high torque on them. And again, in a 3 8 or a quarter inch extension, you're not going to be putting high torque on it anyway. So you can take the cheap here. You don't have to go and spend $45 on a, uh, what is this, maybe a 16 inch um, extension. It, it's it's not right. Just buy a cheap one. You don't really need an expensive one. However, when you get into swivels, especially in the small engine department, you're going to need swivels. Okay. The thing is with these, you don't want to oil them, and you want to buy a good one. And I'll tell you why. Because if you oil it, you use it a lot, and it's cheap, you get this. It just hangs. You don't want that. And here's one. Put a socket on here. And you reach down into an engine compartment and say the nut is right here. And you got to get down at an angle. Well, you can't even get that socket. That socket's just hanging there like fruit off of an old dead tree. Okay, look at that. That's, that's perfect. So, if we take and use a good one that's only been shielded with some WD-40, it's never actually been lubricated. We could put the socket in here. And if it's still in halfway decent shape, it'll hold any angle that I put on it in order to reach. So I could put it at any angle and it will stay there. That's what you want on an extension. Do not over lubricate these because then it will just sag like the other one and becomes worthless. 
So that is that. Here's another ratchet. This one, um, I could plug these guys uh, because it, they're not a bad company. But this is Craftsman. Um, in the U.S., you see these things everywhere. They're in every garage sale in the world. And again, they're kind of nice because they have a snap ring. You can easily pull this apart and re-oil it and keep it in good shape. The internals, again, will rust, especially in salt water. You'll go to use this, it'll still look clean, and everything inside is busted solid. So keep that lubricated. Okay, um, let's see. Chisel. Always want to have one of those handy. Have one clean strictly for gasket surfaces. Never, always have one chisel that has a cover on it. Because if you ever have to do any kind of engine maintenance, replace a water pump or anything on your engine, uh, exhaust manifold, or you have to take and get the gasket cleaned off, the best thing in the world is a chisel, a wood chisel that's been maintained and has a real straight, perfect edge on it. Then back edge it with a stone. Once it's sharpened, you take the flat side here and just back scrape it at a really strong angle. And you just do a couple of licks like that, and you're good for scraping gaskets. You don't want to dig in, especially if you're on an aluminum surface. So make sure you put a little relief on the flat edge of this if you're going to dig into aluminum, because you don't you don't want to you're going to scrape aluminum. You don't want to dig in. So put a little relief on that, and have another one for woodworking or other jobs around the world, cleaning up your soft finish and whatever. Uh, it's good to have two of these. This is just my normal maintenance one. I really don't. That one I've actually hit with a hammer. So, and you can do that with a certain one. Small crowbar, something you want to have to pry engine parts apart, uh, or other things on a boat that are coming apart and need that. Keep a set of small taps for fixing your mast or your rigging, or cleaning out some uh, bolts or nuts that might have uh, gotten compromised on the thread. So it's always good to have these, but remember, these things rust like crazy. Keep them sealed, oiled, Whatever you got to do, maintain them. A rusty tap is no good. It's like this. Rusty ratchet. No place on a boat, the rust sort of spreads. It's like a bad disease. Once one part's rusted, it spreads all over the rest of the toolbox and makes everything hard to work with. Everything becomes dirty, covered in this oxidized film. Uh, and then you're just making a mess about your boat. So when you see something like this, throw it away, take it home. Donate it, put it in a garage sale or something, but get it off the boat. Okay. Now, oh, and a pair of uh, vernier calipers. Really good thing to have on the boat. Doesn't necessarily have to be electronic or with the dial, as long as it has a scale on it. And you can measure nuts and bolts, hardware. Uh, always good to have one of those along with a ruler or a tape measure. You should always have those two items. And if you really think you're going to need it and you're doing a lot of work, I keep a set of these on my boat too, my chronometers. But again, they're rust prone. And you don't want to get any rust on these. And never, ever, ever, if you have a small one that goes down to less than one inch, when you're storing it, you cannot leave it closed because as the temperature changes, this thing starts to expand and contract and it will no longer be accurate. So always store them. If you do have my chronometers on a boat, store it open always and keep it well lubricated all right most boats electrical systems now are really intense there's a lot to them they're not just a couple of wires and a battery anymore like they were 50 years ago this is one of the best things to have on a boat a good meter now you don't need to go as far as this one this one here was about 400 dollars but i was using it in my employment on a boat you don't need to measure within a tenth of an ohm resistance as long as you can get to an accuracy within one ohm, you're good. You want to be able to read AC, DC, 12 volts, 110, amperage. You need all the scales you can get and modes because you want to be able to test things. If you've got two wires running 60 feet up your mast and you want to make sure there's continuity on the light bulb up there, you can put this down to where it rings. Okay, It just makes a uh, beeping tone if you have continuity. Or if any of the wires are running to ground, you want to make sure that uh, you can hear the tone all of a sudden. You're checking to make sure nothing's going to ground. All of a sudden, you hear a tone. Uh, you got a wire that's grounded out somewhere. So you want to check that. Now, if you've got a high-tech engine that has uh, 
the minor computers on it. You're going to want to be really careful with a digital meter like that because it puts out voltage and it could destroy a computer. So check with the manufacturer, your manual. There's a good chance if you have a computer, you might want one of these. It's an old fashioned analog meter. I keep one of these too, just in case I'm ever around a radio because I fix everything myself around here because I'm living on a micro budget like a lot of sailors. So if anything dies, like my radios or you know any kind of navigation equipment that I have, I have to fix it myself. And this is a good thing to have because it doesn't pump out too much voltage. I'm probably not going to damage a lot of circuit boards with this. This one, however, can damage high-tech computer equipment. So be really careful how you use it. Um, and I would suggest, you know, a manufacturer's manual from whatever you're repairing. But these are good too because you can figure out your draw. Let's say you've got three lights and a spotlight. You want to know how much amperage you're going to run off the battery over a given amount of time. Well, if you use Ohm's Law, you can actually find the resistance of each item using this. Divide it by 12 or 110 or whatever voltage system you're using and figure out exactly how many amps it's going to draw over a given time. So it's really good to have something like this just to figure out how much power you're going to lose over a week's time drawing an amp and a half from your navigation lights. Well, it's easy. Find the resistance and calculate it with Ohm's Law. If you have a real a larger boat with a generator system and solar panels and wind generators and all that and the uh, inverters for changing 12 volts into 110 or 120 whatever they theoretically call it now um, those systems can get high-tech and problems you can run into difficulties on or offshore another good thing to have is a set of these these are circuit breakers for testing circuits. If you have something and every time you turn it on, it's blowing a fuse. Well, instead of continuing to blow the fuse, uh, you could set this one. This one um, is a 10, 15, and a 20 amp. Okay, guaranteed up to, uh, uh, I'm not sure what voltage these are, these are good to. Uh, a blue point kit like this is available online or through a snap-on dealer. And I'm sure that there's other brands. Again, you don't need to spend $85 on a set like this. Um, you can go to any place and buy a set of breakers. Breakers are breakers. They're not going to be a whole heck of a lot of difference between a $300 set and a $20 set. But breakers are good to have. Because if you've got something that's continually blowing fuses, there's really not a place that you can stop in the mid-Atlantic to go buy more fuses for your boat after you just blew 30 of them. So breakers are a good thing to have to test the circuit. Um, I think we covered it about everything that I could think of we covered. If I missed anything, oh, breaker bars. Never leave home without this either. This is really important. You need to bust a lot of large nuts and bolts loose on your engine for any reason. Or the shaft couplings. Shaft couplings don't come off easy. Okay, you're going to need one of these too. So. Ideally, shop for the tools. Uh, the minimum you think you're going to need. It's no sense piling up 600 pounds worth of tools on your boat, uh, especially if you're going to stay near coastal. But get what you think you're really going to need because one thing about sailing or power boating or any kind of boating is it's constant maintenance and things are constantly breaking. And out there in the wind and waves, one thing you can count on is change uh, with the weather and with the vessel you're on. And there's always going to be something to repair. So having the right tools is absolutely one of the most important things about boating. So I'm going to call it a day here. Thank you very much for watching. Please leave a comment if you have anything you want to add. Um, if I misspoke on anything, please let me know. And we can fix that. And if there's anything you'd like to see in upcoming episodes, uh, please let me know. And please subscribe. Thank you very much.